an announcement today by Locomotion, the Railway Museum in Shildon, that the ironwork for Stevenson's Gondless Bridge is due to move from the National Railway Museum in York to Locomotion is very welcome news. So here's a little bit more about that innovative and pioneering railway structure, the Gondless Bridge. This talk lasts less than eight minutes. The Stockton and Darlington Railway, which opened on the 27th of September 1825, was the railway that got the world on track. Here we see a combination of innovation, technical and engineering genius, and the vision that one day you could lunch in Darlington and go to the opera in London that same evening. The Gondless Bridge was part of that engineering genius. Most of the proposed 26 miles of mainline railway was on relatively level ground. But in the first five miles at the west end, there were two ridges in the landscape, Etherley and Brusselton, and the River Gonless was in between and would need to be crossed. George Stevenson, working for the Stockton and Darlington Railway, designed two rope pulled inclines powered by stationary engines to get wagons over these two ridges. But there remained the problem of crossing the river. Here's a more detailed look at its location between West Auckland and St Helens Auckland. And here is my dog standing on one of its remaining abutments looking across to the other. You can see that as bridges go, it's now missing something important. But look, here it is in its majestic form as designed by George Stevenson. So let's look at the life of the Gonless Bridge from inception to 2020. Stevenson submitted designs for the bridge to the directors of the SNDR on the 28th of December 1822. Having obtained the board's approval, the casting of the metalwork was carried out by Burrell & Company of Newcastle. Burrell & Company were located next to Robert Stevenson's works at 4th Street in Newcastle. Robert was George's son and George was a partner in the firm of Burrell & Company. The bridge was completed by October 1823 it was an innovative combination of cast iron and wrought iron with stone abutments. It had been built with three spans across the river, but heavy snow followed by flooding when the thaw came damaged the bridge, and so Stevenson rebuilt it with four spans to allow more space for flood water. So you can see four spans here. Looking at its construction in more detail, the stone abutments were quite ornate with string coursing and sweeping wing walls that terminated in circular piers, the remains of which you can see here. Technologically, it was an innovative design. The inward leaning cast iron pillars were braced apart by a cast iron X frame. Walkways, the whole route had walkways on either side of the track, were cantilevered out from the sides of the decking. The use of additional iron pillars at the end of the bridge meant that it was a self-supporting structure, even without the stone abutments. The clever use of opposing forces of compression and tension created with the use of lens-shaped ironwork with additional vertical supports created an engineering balancing act which literally spread the load throughout the structure. It was also held together without the use of nuts and bolts, apparently. It was the first railway bridge to use this iron lenticular truss design, which is extremely unusual although the idea of this kind of bridge had been explored on paper in the 17th century in Croatia. It's also often credited as being the first iron railway bridge in the world, although that claim is quite a complex one and depends on what you call a railway. It is in any case a very rare type of bridge and the earliest of its type. The bridge remained intact until 1901 when the ironwork was dismantled the trestle legs were cut off at river level and the superstructure moved to Brusselton Colliery for storage. The remains of the trestle legs can still apparently be seen on the riverbed when water levels are low. Alterations were made so that the bridge could carry heavier loads. The two stone abutments remained but they were altered to accommodate plate girders. This required recesses to be cut into the abutments which can still be seen today. So from 1901, the bridge looked like this, with the stone abutments altered and the ironwork gone. So let's leave the bridge abutments for a moment and follow the ironwork that was taken down in 1901. The original 
Royal Ironwork was moved to a private collection. However, when a railway museum opened in 1928 at Queen Street, York, the bridge was one of the exhibits. It was then moved to its current position at the National Railway Museum in York in 1975. In 2006, I had some correspondence with Durham County Council in the National Railway Museum as part of a council project regarding the possible relocation of the ironwork from the NRM York to the Railway Museum in Shildon. There was agreement that the iron structure could come to locomotion in Shildon rather than staying in York. Most parties agreed that the structure would be at risk of vandalism if returned to the abutments themselves. Costs were obtained to carry out a feasibility study to look at the practicalities of moving the structure, but nothing further happened. In January 2014, back at the National Railway Museum in York, non-historic timber work was removed from the iron structure, but the historic timber work was retained, but was recorded as suffering from rot. Biological accretions were also visible in parts of the metal frame. Overall, the bridge condition was described as poor, and requiring remedial work in terms of cosmetic appearance and fair in terms of structure. In 2016, when writing the Historic Environment Audit for the Stockton and Darlington Railway on behalf of the local councils, we once again recommended that the iron work should be moved to locomotion in Shildon. In 2017, Durham County Council funded the removal of graffiti and the repair of some stonework to the bridge but the work was undone almost immediately by vandals. In December 2018, the Friends journal The Globe was published, which featured an article by one of our members, Brendan Boyle, criticising the National Railway Museum for hiding the bridge away in a staff car park. As the editor, I gave Andrew McLean, Assistant Director and Head Curator of the National Railway Museum, an opportunity to respond. He took issue with the criticism, pointing out that it was next to a well-used entrance, but nevertheless, he stated, I think we are all in agreement that the Gonless Bridge needs to be moved to a more prominent and suitable location. He's talking here about the ironwork. And that is exactly what we intend to do. Our stated intention, fully supported by the director of the Science Museum Group and the director of the NRM, is for the bridge to come to locomotion. He also went on to point out that there were considerable logistical difficulties in doing this, not the least of which is the expense. Meanwhile, the ironwork from the bridge has now spent longer on display as a museum artefact than it did in service as a bridge. You can understand, therefore, why we are thrilled that the ironwork is now definitely coming to Shildon. While it will not be exactly coming home, it is pretty close and people will be able to walk between the remaining stone bridge abutments and locomotion at Shildon, where they will be able to view the ironwork in the place where the modern railway network was born. Stevenson's contribution to the development of the modern railway network has been recognised in our range of designer gifts inspired by him, including, amongst other things, pewter bookmarks, carriage clocks, products decorated with locomotion number one, which was designed by him, and a signed book on Wylam where Stevenson was born. Do have a browse at www.therailwaystation.shop.